Well, welcome everybody to podcast episode number 50. I can't believe it. The DanJohnUniversity.com podcast is, it's got its own Latin letter, L. Uh, before we begin, I want to make sure I thank everyone for listening, and especially uh, our listener and good friend, Mike, who no donated $50 in my name to a charity uh, celebrating this uh this 50th podcast. So thank you so much to Mike and all of you for supporting what we do here. Before I begin, uh, I just want to share some things. Uh, first, uh, we've basically finished the audio book for my next book, which is called Attempts. And these are essays in health, uh, fitness, longevity, and easy strength. And speaking of easy strength, right now I'm working on some interesting ideas about incorporating the ideas of easy strength with fat loss. Uh, it's an area I'm certainly no expert in, but uh, I've been really interested to see how uh, ramping up a short, intense little training program, which is easy strength, you know, followed by long walks or heavy hands or rucking, whatever whatever's appropriate for you to get to your, your heart rate. And it's really been some interesting, not only the researching has been fun and the experimenting has been fun, but the concept seems to really interest me. So I'll keep you informed as things go. Uh, I'm putting together a, a document of some kind. I don't know if it's going to be just a uh, an essay, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll get back to you more on that. But basically so far, the template looks something like this. Uh, get a good night's sleep, uh, wake up, drink coffee because of the caffeine as I understand it, <laughs> releases uh, free fatty acids, and then you continue your fast, and then you get the, the short, easy strength to work out in, which is very short. And, and when you put down that last rep, you go for a walk. And if the workout takes you 10 to 12 minutes, then you want to go for about a 50-minute walk, because I'd like to see everything done in one hour. Uh, so far with my little experiments, it has been just a masterfully fun thing to do. I'm, uh, I'm amazed how obvious it is to me right now. But, of course, you know, we have to do some before and afters and check on things. And uh, I'll keep you informed. Okay, we have a question from Ilico. Or Aliso. Do you prefer safety squats or zercher squats for people with tight shoulders that can't get into the back squat position? Um... You know, with Zercher squats, uh, they, they tend to rise and fall in popularity. Uh, the only person I really know uh, who's gotten a lot out of them is my friend uh, Steve Shaffley. Uh, Zercher squats, uh, for those you who don't know, it's where you hold the, the weight in the elbow when you squat. Uh, Zercher squats, obviously, were the foundation of the goblet squat, which I invented. And it's why double kettlebell front squats work so well. When you put the load here, everything seems to streamline in the squat. That's why I'm such a big fan now of uh, teaching people bear hug carries with squats in, in the walk because it just simplifies things. Uh, the safety squat bar is really expensive. What I use is I use Dave Draper's True Squat, True Squat, T-R-U Squat. Um, they're very reasonable. Uh, you get them from on-target publications. Um, at my old gym, we had uh, every squat rack had one, and so we would uh, we would rotate through uh, the true squat as part of our squatting program, and uh, I was surprised how a how quickly you know 13 year old boy can learn how to do it, and how it seemed to really clean up a lot of the interesting squat stuff, and it's a very simple thing. It's a, it's a basically a little th harness here. You can pat it or not pat it, and the bars are here, and it feels a little bit like a little bit more like squatting. The safety squat racks I used to use, uh, you could squat hundreds of pounds more than normal because of everything. It was the, the, the big bent bar, and you could have your hands all the way down here. Um, so that's that's my that's my suggestion to you uh, is to get the true squat. But certainly, I have no issues with you. Uh, having to uh, adapt with the, with the shoulder flexibility problem. Of course, the other side of it is, let's make sure we deal with that shoulder flexibility, shoulder mobility issue. I get it. People get hurt, and we got to work around it. But uh, I'd also love to see you try to uh, 
uh, to deal with the issue long term and see if you can get those shoulders, whatever has to be done, um, mobility work, flexibility work, uh, up to surgery if you have to. Uh, it, it, that's that's. Uh, I, I mean, I know that's a duh, but it is an important duh to talk about. Thank you. I hope that helped. Peter uh, goes right to the point here. Peter, with CrossFit now imploding under Glassman's lack of understanding of the world uh, and perhaps a slightly enlarged ego, slightly, if someone from the world of CrossFit were to contact you and, and ask you how to reboot CrossFit, um, yeah, I don't... I don't foresee someone from CrossFit asking because um, they became, uh, so as a professor of religious studies, I have to be very careful about what I'm about to say. Um, they became, uh, the, the, the word cult uh, traditionally means the, the, the way uh, uh, an organized religion practices. And of course it's become a, a word now in 2020 to mean a certain, it's a derogatory term about religions, but. Um, they certainly had some practices and some opinions that were strange. Uh, I was at a, uh, a conference one time, I think it was Perform Better, and uh, I just said, watch this. And I just looked over to my friend, heck, it might have been Taylor Lewis, and I said, CrossFit. And this woman walked over and said, are you guys talking about CrossFit? And, I, and he looked at me like, wow, because <laughs> it was like a magic trick. Um, you know, my old joke about... Uh, how do you know someone's a CrossFitter? Because you met them 10 seconds ago. Uh, I guess it's not as funny as it used to be. Um, I doubt they'll contact me, but let's go with the, the question itself, Peter. How could the idea of high intensity training be made more reasonable? And could it be made a good template for health and fitness? Well, that's the problem, Peter. There's this idea that CrossFit, this CrossFit model is somehow better than what the rest of us have been doing for the past well over 100 years. Um, yeah, there is a place for high intensity, but it has to be tempered with, uh, you know, periods of, of normal training. Um, and I think, you know, constantly racing and chasing and, and having poor repetitions, um, th this, th I think they called it, the CrossFit called it the slop factor. I mean, that is against everything in the classic strength tradition. Sloppy reps are where you get hurt. Uh, the elbow issues those guys have, the knee issues, the back issues. Um, you know, the that very, very short window of time people do it. You know, almost every CrossFit coach I knew there for a while became a rehabilitation coach, not a, you know, <laughs> you hurt your athletes and then you fix them and then you write a book about how you fix athletes. Well, I go back to that first part, you hurt your athletes. To me, that's where we start and that's not what we want to do. Um, what I would still get you back to doing, Peter, is I go to Dan John University, look at the workout generator, put in what you have, and follow those workouts for a couple of months. When you feel the need to ramp it up, go uh, go attack a specific goal, a specific challenge, and do it, and then ease back up. To me, that is Tommy Kona would have told you that, Percy Cerruti would have told you that, Cer Percy Cerruti would have told you that. This is the way we train, and I think we should get back to it. Uh, this idea that you can, you know, you constantly have to chase a million butterflies at, at once makes no sense to me. But uh, that's enough. That's that's just a. I'm gonna go yell at the clouds right now. Okay, or <laughs> yell at the kids on the lawn. Thank you, Peter. It's a good question. Uh, my answer would be the same answer I've had for decades. Just train appropriate. You know. Uh, you know, just just train appropriately and you'll be fine. Thank you. Well, this is exciting. This is from Jim. Greetings from one St. Veronica's Falcon to another. St. Veronica's School, 434 Alita Way in South San Francisco. Uh, That's where I went to, to uh, uh, first through eighth grade. Uh, both my parents were buried there. Uh, a lot of great memories. Thank you, Jim. I have a question regarding the best way to train as we age. Specifically, I just turned 69 years old and I am 5 feet 10 inches and 170. First off, hats off to you. You're training, you're sneaking up on 70, and you're keeping your weight at 170. Good job. 
I have been training since I was a young teen, except for those times that life got in the way. Passed the RKC two and a half years ago. Prepping for the RKC was tough, and I really beat myself up physically preparing for it. Well, hey, hats off to you, someone over 65 making the RKC. That's, that's very good. Lately, I have been feeling that he lifting heavy takes a toll out of me. It, it, and it certainly does for a lot of people. I have even gone a rest day. I've gone to a rest day after each workout, which is good advice. Um, currently, my training involves using kettlebells, barbells, and TRX, a suspension trainer. I must add that I do have diagnosed lower back issues, and doing anything where I round my lower back will cause me to take a break for a few weeks of time. Seems that my back muscles get tight, and I don't like to and don't like to loosen up. Wondering if a hypertrophy program or a heavy program or a combination of both would be my best bet going forward as I do not see myself ending my training due to my age. Well, and then he asks if I have any advice. And well, yeah, I mean, after age 55, Jim, you want to really focus finally uh, on bodybuilding, uh, lean body mass. So anything that works on hypertrophy and joint mobility is going to be your friend. So, and with your, what you have here, you, you've got the toolkit you need. With the TRX, you're gonna to wanna to spend a lot of time with the T's, the Y's, and the I's, if you can do it. Lots of single arm rowing, rowing. Uh, the, the suspension trainers are amazing for training the, the, the upper body pulling. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm surprised how simple it is and how good it is. But, uh, you know, you can, uh, that's something uh, uh, Mike Brown and I do five days a week is we do TRX work. Uh, we, it, we obviously change things around a little bit, uh, but a fair amount of T's, Y's, rowing, single arm rowing each week. Uh, I think there is some hypertrophy work that I get out of it, but I also notice that I just, I just feel a little bit taller and better all the time. I would strongly recommend to you the half kneeling presses because that's going to give you some uh, mobility work. You know, the half kneeling position is the hip flexor stretch. And it will also limit the load you can use. So if you get 8 to 12 reps uh, per side, uh, that's going to, half kneeling, that's going to make your loads a little lighter. And it, if it's going to kind of save that back issue you have. Um, certainly you've got goblet squats you could do if you can do them. Uh, double kettlebell front squats. Uh, one thing I'd even recommend uh, as you age a little bit, maybe a very light kettlebell in the one hand and a fairly heavy kettlebell in the other. So when you do your double kettlebell front squats, there is an asymmetry there, which will force you to, you know, need to make minor correct corrections through here, your column or your core, which will might even allow that back to practice the brace better, the, the brace, the and the kind of position that, which, will, which will help you. But yeah, so Jim, hypertrophy work as much as you can, joint mobility, and we can get both of them in a movement. That's what you're looking for. That's why that's why you'll notice I said half, half kneeling presses and the, the squat family, because those movements are gonna be mobility work and uh, hypertrophy work at the same time, which is what we need after 55. So yeah, I, I in fact, if you just decide to train three days a week uh, and and skip you know uh, in the weight room and focus on uh, mobility and uh, hypertrophy, that's not a bad little workout. Sprinkle some walking and maybe you know and if if it's something you do normally a, a rock or just going for a heavy hands walk or something like that, that's not a bad combination. Um, you have to make the other decisions. For example, very often I'll recommend bike riding, uh, but you have to, it all depends kind of with bike riding and swimming. It kind of depends on where you live a little bit. Uh, where I live now is a great place for an adult to go bike riding because I live in an area with, that the streets aren't very busy and I've got, a, I've got a massive park right across the street from me. Uh, getting to that park, though, I take my life in my hands on something we call Ninth East here, and no one seems to understand that you're supposed to give the right of way to pedestrians, which is an issue. Um, but once I get over there, I can ride my bike in and, and not worry about anything, um, except, for, except for maybe hitting a mud patch and falling. 
but uh, I hope that helps, Jim. And uh, it's 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 great to, and I'm really happy that someone from uh, St. Veronica has reached out to me. Thank you so much. We have a question from Adam. I am 43 years old, five foot 11 and 170 pounds. I've always had a small frame. I was wanting to start an old time strongman type program using kettlebells and dumbbells. I was wondering if your one lift a day workout could be modified to these implements to achieve the relative strength and build of the old timers like Saxon and to a lesser degree Sandow. Um, well, it'd be interesting. I mean, you know, um, in in the in the RKC two, you know, we do teach those old time moves. Um, uh, there's construction going on in front of my house. Uh, maybe you could work for these guys. Um, but yeah, so if you decided, uh, what was his Otto Arco, you know, he became a Turkish get up specialist, uh, uh, eventually doing uh, body weight it, with a barbell, which is impressive. That'd be doing 170 for you. That would be impressive. Uh, you could do, I'm not a big fan of the bent press, but if you decide to do something like that, but certainly, yeah. Um, one of the things you'll pick up on when you read the old time strongman is that a lot of them did lots and lots of two handed uh, you know, dumbbells, kettlebells, uh, various standing presses, uh, a lot of leaning presses. One of the things they spent a lot of time was putting weights overhead and picking them up off the ground. And that's the still the advice I give to every single person listening today. But absolutely, it would be uh, if you don't mind, Adam, uh, put together the lifts you know and send it in to me. I'd like to see what you decide on. Um, if you did decide, we'll just we'll just invent something. We'll, okay, there, this is just three days. So you can do uh, Turkish get-ups. Uh, in, by the way, gentle listeners, in his case, because of what he wants to do, I am okay with heavy Turkish get-ups, in his case. Um, the next day, uh, double presses, overhead presses, and day three, windmills. Well, you know, if you take the, each one of those serious, that's going to be by itself a great workout. And the total body tension that you're building up will really be interesting to see what happens long term. Adam, it's a good question. Put together a program, ping it back into me. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Christopher writes us, I need to lose some weight. He's five foot nine, 210 pounds with a 38 inch waistline. Well, 210, that's, yeah, okay. Uh, it's too high, I know, he tells us. And I've heard you talk about the fast mimicking diet. Bought the book, scares the hell out of me. Uh, tried the eight-hour diet thing before, hated it. Huh, okay. And the Velocity diet, which scares me less. Huh? So I decided to dive in and, and bought the Velocity diet. It appears a bit more reasonable now from than when I did it. And it yeah, they changed the diet around. Um, and you can get one real meal a day on top of the shakes. My current diet is pretty good during the week. Um, weekends tend to splurge more. The ebook comes with their suggested workout, three days a week plus weekend body weight workout. I know you don't like to comment on other workout plans, but any other suggestions for me, keep doing park bench while on velocity diet or try their workouts or does it make a difference? You know, Christopher, for me, the first two weeks, I could barely work out. I, I was not, the, it was not the proudest two weeks of my the, work, the first week was terrible. Uh, I, but by week three, I started Olympic lifting again and doing complexes. And I tell you, that's when the weight really dropped off for me. So, but that's me. Yeah, you could certainly just do, uh, I don't know, Christopher, if you're doing the, the, the workout generator, but I would suggest if you're doing the velocity diet, probably plug in four days a week and then maybe go Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then a Saturday workout. But, um, it's interesting because the new, and if you don't mind talking, the new Velocity Diet looks exactly like uh, Dan and Mary Eads. They are the protein power people. Uh, it looks exactly like their middle-aged makeover diet to me, um, which, by the way, I did, and uh, it worked pretty well. Um, that's So it's, that's three protein shakes a day, with the morning one basically being a... A coffee, a coffee infused protein drink, and then a, you know a very you know a, you know a, a normal leafy green um, protein dinner, you know chicken salad dinner or whatever it was. I don't remember. 
but yeah, that that can work very well, Christopher. <clears throat> The thing, the thing I'd like you to start thinking though about is, um, it seems like you know, and you, you mentioned this a few times about how you, you have an emotional response to every diet you look at: fast mimicking, velocity, and uh, the eight-hour, uh, the eight-hour constricted, you know, intermittent fasting. That's something uh, I don't know what your age is, but that might be something we need to talk about long term. Okay. Um, this is just because I had the same issues uh, in my younger life. Um, and I'm really, really glad I, I kind of came around to not being so frightened of the idea of going hungry. It, but I got to tell you, what changed my life was the Velocity Diet. Since then, I've realized that there's, there's fasting and hunger uh, that's not starving. And it really helped me. I want you to think about that a little bit, Christopher. Thank you. And get back to me on how this is going. Thank you. Well, uh, Shiloh writes this. I just want to say I'm a big fan of your work. Well, thank you very much. And became an even bigger fan when I realized you went to South City High like me. South San Francisco Unified School District High School Warriors. Go Warriors. Thanks so much. Uh, it's, it's good to hear from you. Uh, I, I'm from Francisco Terrace, uh, Shiloh. So that's right next to the school and... Uh, uh, it was a, it's a, it was a tough place to grow. It was tough as in it was a, it was, you had to watch what you said in my neighborhood. I'm a U.S. Army officer. I'm currently trying to figure out the best way to train for the new Army combat fitness test. Specifically, I'd like to know how you would advise soldiers to train for the standing power throw event. Link to the event. I know it. The, the event requires the participant to throw a 10-pound medicine ball behind them for distance. How similar would other throwing events like the discus and shot put compare with regards to training, that is, training with the Olympic lifts? Well, you know, Shiloh, the, the biggest thing I got to tell you is that um, this is one of the few times that the test is a great training protocol. Uh, I, I think that if you and a buddy just picked up uh, the 10 pound medicine ball and played catch with it every day, um, on days where I don't know exactly what I want to do, Mike and I will go out, or anybody else, uh, I've played catch with everybody, and we'll play catch with the medicine ball, 15 to 20 minutes of playing catch. So you're gonna throw it this way, you're gonna throw it with uh, your, your, your normal throwing stance, and then what we call goofy foot, which is the opposite throwing stance. You can't see my feet moving. Uh, feet really tight together, do like a jump shot throw, um, every way you can think of, throw it sideways, and then throw it, throw it behind your behind your head. Uh, it is a, I, I don't think the U.S. military yet appreciates how great medicine ball training is. Uh, I recommend it a lot with my special forces friends. Uh, yes, the Olympic lifts are going to be great for this drill, but it's also great just to get this into your workout. Percy Sarity uh, had his in his uh, uh, in his recommendations for throwers, had them up to an hour of playing medicine ball. Now, if you really want to get involved in this, I want you to look up the game Hoover Ball. Hoover, President Hoover, Hoover Ball. And it's medicine ball, volleyball. And if you can get a group of people playing that, all your hopes and dreams for this new test will come true. And by the way, thanks so, so much for mentioning that you're from South City. Uh, I'm very proud of uh, being a St. Veronica's Falcon, uh, Southwood Savage, uh, South City Warrior, Skyline Trojan, and of course, Utah State Aggie. But uh, uh, South City changed my life, uh, well, obviously. So thank you and good luck. Um, if you have follow-up questions on this, uh, email me and then I'll ask Brian and ask Brian to send the emails right to me and we can talk more specifically. Thank you. We have a question from Justin. I'm currently in the final throws of the 10,000 Swing Challenge with my 17-year-old daughter. Oh, congratulations, that's great. And we are starting the mountain climbing program shortly. Uh, if you're just listening, these are all available at danjohnuniversity.com. Unfortunately, my daughter only has single kettlebells of appropriate size for pressing. So my question is for the seesaw press walk and for the farmer carries, would she be better using two different size bells are doing a variation of these movements with a single bell. Uh, you know, it's 
using odd size bells, I'm a big fan of that. I, I learned this from the late, great uh, Lane Cannon. And he used to, he used to just cobble together any, any weights he could. He had, a, he had a fascinating gym set up. I miss him. Uh, but there is a lot to learn from having uneven loads. Uh, very often when I teach uh, kettlebell certs, I have people do the seesaw press with odd weights uh, just to get used to how, well, it's it's just different. It's new. It, it's a different stimulus. And I, I think there's great value in that. Uh, yeah, on the farmer walks, I've always believed in odd sizes. And that's kind of where we morphed into the suitcase carry. The farmer walk, uh, I mean, I remember doing the suitcase carry and I kind of remember like inventing it. But um, it was because of the odd size and we just kept going odder and odder. And uh, one day I think we had a massive one and a light one and we just tried the massive one and all of a sudden we got all those great benefits that Stu McGill talks about with the uh, suitcase carry. Yeah, so I think it's just fine. Uh, and I just think it's great that you guys are doing this together, Justin. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, would you mind also on one of your podcasts discussing how you program training for yourself or your students who are on the road frequently with minimal access to equipment one away. Yeah, I'll, right now, we'll talk about it right now, okay? Uh, I travel a lot, well, I traveled a lot, uh, you know, uh, you might not know, but I, I travel, you know, last year, 260,000 miles, you know, over a quarter million miles a year uh, traveled, uh, it's not been that way. But I always travel in my bag, I keep, I keep three things for training. Uh, one, I always travel with a Brett Contreras glute loop. I always travel with a Perform Better black mini band. And I always travel with a light uh, blue lacrosse ball that Coach uh, Joe D gave me. And it's a little softer than a normal one. Um, with the lacrosse ball, I'll, I'll rub my feet. I don't know what it is about travel, but my feet tend to get kind of beat up. Someone told, told me it's because your feet swell on flights. And I think my hands do, because I really noticed that. And I always blame the salt, but the feet too. So rolling your feet out when you first get somewhere really seems to help. And if you go to Europe and you walk more and you're American, you'll want to rub your feet out because you're just not used to it. With the mini band, I do uh, the monster walks on my feet. With the glute loop, I do clamshells and hip thrusts. And then I flip over and do push-ups. So to me, the hip thrust, clamshell, mini band walk, and push-up. And when I do the push-ups, I really strive on the road to really make sure, you know, I'm really locked and loaded um, so I don't get uh, I don't get too jacked up. Um, to me, that's the best thing. That's those. So it's really simple things. Now, you said no equipment, and I just told you to bring equipment. But if you don't have equipment, you can always do uh, air, you know, goblet squats with uh, Gideon's Bible. Uh, you can do push-ups on the floor. I, I've never been, and this is just a change, never was wrong. In the past 42 years, I've become less and less concerned about training on road trips. Uh, back when I was young, I had to Olympic lift and I'd go find a, a place and it never worked out well. Now I, I like the natural um, waviness of it, the natural rhythm of it, where I don't train. And I like, I'll, I'll be in my room, uh, you know, doing this is a very common one I do on the road. I do uh, 15 hip thrusts, 15 clamshells, 14 hip thrusts, 14 clamshells, 13, 13, 12, 12. And if you flip over, do that with push ups too, it, it's a brutally hard workout. Uh, so you go 15, 15, 15, 14, 14, 14, 13, 13, 13. Um, and what's weird about that workout is when you finish, you, the one of the things I say to myself every time is, why don't I do more of that at home, you know? But that's good because that's, to me, if you follow my, my point about the rhythms of things, that's my road workout. Here I do a different kind. So there's some value there. Um, is the easy solution on the weeks a way to adjust the workout generator for the equipment you have access to, or does continual adjustment like this affect the progressions? Well, what you could easily do now, if you're talking about the workout generator that's at Dan John University, you probably could just plug in no equipment. 
I've done a couple of the no equipment workouts and they're not bad at all. Uh, there's, there's a jumping squat in there and there's some, there's some kind of different variations of hinges. I would never do them in my home gym. But hey, you're by yourself in a hotel room, you can, you can do that odd thing. Uh, so there's two answers, okay? One, the Dan John answer, glute loop, mini band, lacrosse ball. The no equipment workout generator one. Both are excellent. There's no problem with either of them. And don't forget, while you're on the road, eat, eat the local cuisine, go for long walks, and just have some great adventures. Thank you. Kevin uh, has, a, has an interesting question. I'm in between multiple wrist surgeries and wondering what type of workouts you would recommend and any advice for the emotional aspect of being in recovery. My injury was on the job and I haven't worked since August 2019. Uh, there's, there's a couple things here. Well, first off, uh, this wrist, two major surgeries, uh, just real lots of damage there. And this is when I picked up an, an interesting thing, I think 2001, 2002, something like that. But um, we would do the uh, the 100 rep challenge, and that's when you buy that, uh, folks, if you don't know, it's when you take a single lift and you do it 100 times. Um, not 100 reps, but 100 singles. So I think the first time I did it, I did it with a squat snatch, and I did it with 165, which was tough. I've done it with uh, the clean and the clean and jerk with like 165, the power clean with 185. But one time I did it with the front squat with 255 with my arm in a, in a, in a, in a cast and I front squatted like this. So Kevin, if it's, if it's just one wrist, I would suggest as much as you can do it, squat, 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 because squat and I, I front squatted, but you could probably work on a back squat variation. Um, the reason I say that is every, when you're doing that workout and all those hormones are kicking out the free fatty acids and the amino acids, they're not just swimming to your glutes and your, your quads, they're going through the whole system. So that's, it's going to send a lot of good stuff into that region. And then I worked really hard on my offside, uh, my, my non cast side as much as I possibly could. Dr. Vanderhoef told me. He never had a patient recover quicker from this kind of surgery in his whole career. And, I, and he said, what did you do? And I said, well, two things. One, I did your advice and I did these exercises you told me to do, you know, uh, hours at a time. And I, I worked out. And he said, hmm, yeah, what, I mean, in other words, you did what I told you to do? And I said, yeah. So number one, I would say do what you, you know, lift where you can, go walk if you can, do whatever you can, do it. And by the way, that's going to help with the part two question on the emotional side. <sighs> All I can say is, Kevin, I'm walking with you on this one. The, the emotional hit for me, you know, my wife uh, went on the road the Monday after my, when I was still in the original, so the pre-surgery cast. So I broke it in the weightlifting meet and had a cast. And then I had a surgery, I had a cast. And then later I had another surgery to remove all the metal, which was a lot, but I'd already healed. I'd healed. I had healed to the point that the body was kicking the, kicking the screws out. That was so gross. <laughs> um, and uh, I just remember getting up, putting the clothes on, it took so long. And then I couldn't tie my own shoes. So I don't know, Kelly might've been in the fifth or sixth grade and had to go, Kelly, will you tie my shoes? And I was just so, I was just so broken hearted. I mean, it was just broken hearted. I mean, and so, and that was just, that was day one. And, you know, uh, obviously I still, you know, I bought a bunch of shoes that uh, don't require, I don't have laces that like they're called loafers or something like that. And it's tough. I mean, I, I, I know it's tough. Fortunately, you know, at the time I was an administrator. So it, I mean, there were impacts and it really, my communications on emails and stuff like that was impacted, but Call, I called a lot more people on the phone and I drove around a lot more and actually I became a better administrator because of that. Um, the emotional side, I just got to tell you, Kevin, it's tough and there's not always a good answer for it. Um, and that's why I meant that when I said I'm walking with you on this. I'd love to be able to throw some fairy dust your way and make it all better, but I, but I can't. 
So hang in there. And if you need professional help on that, please seek it. Jonathan asks uh, a number of easy strength questions. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, I do have a new book coming out called Attempts, Essays on Health, Fitness, Longevity, and Easy Strength. Many of these questions will be answered there. Jonathan asks, when doing easy strength, how much exercise-specific warm-up should you do before the work sets? Now, I don't know if you listen to my lectures or, or whatever, but I didn't do any. Uh, I don't. The weight's not heavy enough to need a warm-up set with. Uh, now, you know, your mileage may vary, and a lot of you are addicted to... I know this, a lot of you are addicted to warm-ups, cool-downs, finishers, and rest periods because that's been the that's been the, the noise for the last couple decades. But uh, when I was coming up, nobody cooled down. Uh, I think you warmed up, but you know, like I said in the book, you know, one of my one of my most famous track meets in my career is I'm sitting in the team bus out here, last call men's discus. And I run down. Fortunately, I brought my, my equipment with me. And I get there, and it is time to throw the discus. The head judge says, where you been? And I, and I change right there in front of a very nice family I just met. And uh, my first throw was my first throw, and my second throw was a lifetime best. And I learned quickly then that that's how we have to be. You don't want your fire department warming up before they leave the firehouse. You, know? you want them to go. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I just didn't need them. If you need a lot of sets to get warmed up to be able to lift a light weight, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to talk about some other things. So for me, I say none. Uh, I would do the least amount necessary. Whatever that it is for you, I don't know that number. Would the power clean work for the explosive movement and easy strength? Well, if you go to Dan John University, you'll find that I have an, a whole thing called easy strength for Olympic lifting, I think. Yeah, the power clean would work. You gotta be good at the power clean. Um, and you really have to know what's a light and easy for you. But yeah, you could you could make it work. Um, I mean, I think snatch, clean and jerk, and farmer walk are the perfect uh, easy strength combination. But you have to know the movements and, and check your ego at the door for a few weeks. Since I'm longer torsoed, should I do rack pulls for deadlift? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, oh, I'm i almost to the point that I'm just telling everybody to just do rack pulls. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. Would you recommend doing easy strength several times in a row for an off-road motorcycle racer? Well, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, not a, that's not a bad idea. Um, off-road motorcycle guys, as... We had a world champion go to my high school, and he was just a little bit older than me. He would train. He was ridiculously strong in a couple of movements. Um, yeah, so the stronger you get, the stronger. I mean, I I would. I think the more you ride, the, the better you're going to be. And so easy strength would support that, especially if you're keeping those workouts around 15 minutes. Those are good questions, Jonathan. But they were easy to answer, but they're good questions. David asks, I am looking for direction on how to make kettlebell movements more dynamic for rugby. I have hit the sinister standard before, and I believe that helped massively. Okay. I currently have access to two times, uh, 228 kilo bells, 136, 148. I do enjoy barbell training, but who knows when gyms will be back in action here. I've been doing movements of the 36, like snatch, snatch the 36, squat, push press, windmill, that's one rep, but I swap hands and do the other side. Or snatch, squat, push press, reverse lunge. I guess there are complexes, but way I was wondering, what I was wondering, if you have any better ideas to implement this type of work. Uh, yeah, I don't know why you just don't do, uh, like with those double 28s, why you don't do the armor building complex. That's two kettlebell cleans, one press, three front squats, and then either do them on the minute every minute or every 30 seconds, you know, when the clock hits the 12 and the, the second hand hits the 12, the second hand hits the 6, 12, 6. I mean, to me, that'd be a much more uh, logical uh, thing for you because you're going to get hit by the bells. You have to have a lot of tension. It'll feel more like a collision sport. Um, I think your, I, I, your complexes are uh, interesting. Uh, doing uh, windmills... Uh, in a, in a complex is, is an interesting decision. 
But I would, uh, I mean, I would just, I wouldn't get as fancy as you're going. I would do the armor building complex, the clean press front squat. And the others, I would just do, I mean, I would do a lot of clean and press. I would do a lot of uh, double kettlebell goblet squat, uh, uh, kettlebell front squats. I'd love to see you do that 48 and 36, you know, 48, 36, and the next, the next set, 48, 36, switching the hands back and forth. I mean, those are, those would be a really good thing. You know, get your reps up to that. You know, get your reps up to the eight, you know, sets of eight. That'd be awesome. You know, do some even number of sets for eight. That'd be nice. But those are just some quick ideas, okay? And uh, David, uh, I love kettlebells, but I think you're, you're going to have to think about the, the barbell as a rugby player too. Thank you. Larry asks a, a really a question. I, I'm almost like, oh boy, here we go. But here we go. Longtime follower and user of the workout generator. Good for you. My question is regarding proper execution of the kettlebell swing. I recently injured my lower back with the swing. So you weren't doing it right. Uh, sorry. Uh, you, you know, I, I wish you had some video. Uh, I'm, my number one suggestion is you stop swinging until you improve your technique. Uh, look, go Google my name and uh, Bulgarian goat bag swing. That's what I'd like you to do. But let's keep going. I was doing about 150 to 200 a week, which is not very many. Took a couple of weeks off from swinging, came back slowly, then tweaked my neck. I have looked at the internet and found many variations. I have used the towel on the bell as recommended by someone, but I do not have a lifting community to fall back on. When I was able to go to the gym, I was the only one doing the swing. So the question, I know you teach hinge plank, but do you stay tight at the top of the plank or let the bell float? Oh, absolutely, do not. I hate that nonsense of letting the bell float. It floats because it, it that's where it's going. No, I believe you grab onto it, you plank that thing, you throw it back. The generator demo looks like a float, but the video of you on YouTube looks like the bell does not come up as high and you look like staying tight. Where can I find the correct form? Well, my, my example that's on, on the, the YouTube, that's what I want you to do, okay? But I don't want you to do swings anymore, Larry. I want you to do the goat bags because those are going to be safer for you. And by having that bell stuck on your belly, you know, a Tarzan, Tarzan belly. When you have a, when you have that weight pushed into your belly, you will keep the brace the whole time, and I don't have to worry about you hurting your back while you're when you when you undo all this. Okay, Larry. I want you to do a workout doing the Bulgarian goat bag swing, and then I want you to send me an, uh, a, a video of it, to, and we'll look at your technique there, okay? And if there's any issues, we'll, we'll take care of them as we can, okay? Thank you. We have an email from Chris. Since stay-at-home orders, I've slowly pieced together a nice little home gym. Good. Equipped with a squat rack, bars, and weights, 195 total, and a 24-kilo kettlebell. I've had my eyes on mass made simple, but do not have a bench, and I am somewhat limited in weights with regard to squats. Do you have any suggestions on how to modify the program? Additionally, since sending this, I also realize that no bench will in inhibit my ability to do bat wings. That said, I have a nice pull-up bar, so perhaps pull-ups would work as a substitute. Well, um, if I was going to drop anything from that, that wonderful book mass made simple on target publications uh it would probably be the bench press uh, and if you skip the bat wings i'm okay with that too and here's the thing chris i don't know what you, it's going to be like but if you do the complexes and since you only have 195 look, it, just just ad adjust the weights as you can you don't tell me your body weight so we don't know but i mean well, even if you weigh 225, 195 is your magic number, and just you know, just do what you can to to make to make those to do whatever, or just pretend you're 185 and that and go to the 185 uh, suggestions. Um, so you'll be doing complexes, you'll be doing the one arm press, you'll be doing the bird dogs, you'll be doing the squats. Um, that's not bad. That's not bad at all. Um, Let's not add anything, but let's you take it really seriously and uh, uh, march on. 
Good luck to you, Chris. Uh, I do want you to keep me uh, updated with your progress. It might, this might actually be a better way to do some of this. And I hope it is, because it's always about feedback, okay? Thank you, Chris. Well, that's it for another week. Thank you so much. And if you have questions, send them to podcast at danjohnuniversity.com and we'll do our best to answer each and every question as appropriate. See you next time.